Thank you for joining the worship services of Shoto, Brady, and Dutton United Methodist Churches. I'm Pastor Julie King, and I'm so grateful for digital technology that allows you to join us from wherever you are in the world. You can join us every week by clicking the links on our Facebook at facebook.com slash Shoto UMC or on our website at umshoto.net. If you like what we are doing and would like to financially support us in ministry, you can find more contact information on our website. And again, that's umshoto.net. We're so grateful that you are joining us. Our first reading is from Micah, chapter 5, verses 2 through 5a the ruler from Bethlehem. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And he shall be the one of peace. If the Assyrians come into our land and tread upon our soil, we will raise against them seven shepherds and eight installed as rulers. And from Luke, verse 1, chapter 39 through 45, Mary visits Elizabeth. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. Amen. This week, the scripture readings finally feel like we're reading the Christmas story. We've really been focusing on the words of the prophet and John the Baptist over the first few weeks of Advent. And now, finally, Jesus, the little baby in the womb, comes into our scripture readings. I love both of these readings. The one from Micah is not exactly a real common reading. In fact, Micah as a prophet is not exactly one of the popular prophets. His book's just this little tiny short book. It's only seven chapters long and within each chapter the verses are only in the teens. They don't go into the 20s or 30s like Jeremiah or like Isaiah does. Micah seems like one of those not important prophets. One that's just kind of At the back of the Old Testament, a little bit of an afterthought. There among Obadiah and Habakkuk, little Jonah. But Micah has a lot to say in a very little bit of wording. I like Micah. He gets straight to the point. He doesn't leave anything out. He doesn't really beat around the bush. He just tells it like it is. And in this scripture reading in particular, he is talking about the ruler of Bethlehem. And he begins it with saying, Oh, Bethlehem of Ephrathah. Now, Ephrathah, as we read this, we might think about as a region, kind of like Judea, because he's talking about this Judean region. But Bethlehem of Ephrathah is the name of the town, according to Micah. 
So why don't we call it Bethlehem of Ephrathah as we talk about it or as we see it in the Gospels? Don't really know. Somehow along the way, it just gets shortened down to Bethlehem. Some people argue that maybe it wouldn't have fit into the song that we sang earlier, that hymn, A Little Town of Bethlehem of Ephrathah. It just doesn't roll off the tongue so nicely. So maybe it got left out along the way. We don't know. But it was Bethlehem of Ephrathah that Micah was talking about. I like to think back about the translations of different words and names at that time. Bethlehem itself most often is translated into the town of bread, the house of bread. Pretty fitting, considering that's the place where Jesus was born. And we later on, of course, learn that Jesus is the bread of life. We remember Christ through communion as we remember his body being the bread that is broken for each of us. But another translation that is less often known is that Bethlehem can also be translated to the house of war. Very different meanings, huh? So which one is it? Is it the house of bread or the house of war? Truthfully, it's both. It can be translated both ways. Something else that's interesting to think about is if we take that full name of Bethlehem, Bethlehem of Ephrathah. Ephrathah is translated into the word fruitful. But it can also be translated to mean barren or worthless. A little town of worthless war. That doesn't sound very fitting, does it? But if we say a little town of fruitful bread, that one makes sense for us as we think about the Bethlehem that we know. It's interesting to me to think about both of these translations. And I find that they do actually both fit into the Christmas story very much. Just as Micah ta talks about this, he's this little prophet and he's talking about these translations. He's talking about Bethlehem of Ephrathah. This place, this house of fruitful bread or this house of war. Micah is one of the less known people. He was a nobody prophet, really, when we compare him to Jeremiah or Isaiah. This little town of Bethlehem, it was a nothing town. There wasn't a whole lot of significance to Bethlehem at that time. And also at that time, there was this lady named Mary. And Mary, to those people, was really a nobody. There wasn't a lot of significance to Mary at that time. How many Marys do all of you know? A lot. Mary didn't have a fancy name like Cleopatra or Jezebel. She was named Mary among the thousands and thousands of Marys at that time. But Mary was called for a very, very special calling a greater calling than any of us have ever experienced, of course. Something I also like to do as I read through these stories is to try and put myself in the shoes of the characters that we read about. You know, as I was a kid, we had a very similar nativity. I think it might actually be the same one to the one that is outside of our church here that lights up. One of my favorite things to do was to play house with baby Jesus. And of course, that meant that I got to be Mary. So I would dress up and I'd put a blanket around my head so that I looked like that Mary. And as I grew up, I imagined that Mary was exactly like the Mary from that nativity scene. When I was about 18 or 19 years old, I had a very wide awakening when I realized that Mary did not look like the 18 or 19 year old me that I envisioned Mary looked like. I thought I was a pretty good character for Mary. I was white like her. I had long hair like her. I really looked the part. I was very mothering like her. I wasn't a mom yet, but I loved babies. 
I felt like I made a great Mary. And then I had a very wise person tell me, Mary didn't look anything like you. She was in the Middle East. And she definitely was not 18 or 19 or 20 years old. You see, of course, it was common in those times when women were physically able to have a baby. That was the time that they would get married. They would get engaged, and that's really what their purpose was. They were to get married and to create more human life. They were to become moms. And that, that was the plan that Mary had for herself. She was engaged to Joseph. They probably had this great life that they had begun planning out in their head. And then all of a sudden, little 12, 13, 14 year old Mary, at this time that she was physically able to have a baby, has this angel come to her and tell her that she is highly favored and that she is going to bear a child and that is going to be God's son. As I think back to little 12, 13-year-old me, or as I think of my own 13-year-old son, if an angel showed up in our living room and was like, hey, got some news for you. You're called to be a mother right now, and not only a mom, but you're a virgin, and you don't have to break that, but you're going to get pregnant, and you're going to be the mother of Jesus. You are going to have God's child that would be huge. I cannot imagine hearing that news. And I think sometimes we read the scripture and we think, you know, Mary probably was like, yes, of course, I'm highly favored and let me just step right into this. But I don't think that's probably how it was for her. We read in the scripture that Mary went with haste to go be with Elizabeth. Elizabeth was also pregnant at this time. Elizabeth had been known to be barren, and she too had been blessed with a son. She goes, and it doesn't say it in this scripture particularly, but as we read through more of the scriptures through the gospel, we know that Mary was there for about three months with Elizabeth. That's a long time to go in process, what this angel has told you. And I think that that is so amazing for us to think about. Mary went with haste. She went quickly, straight to somebody that she loved, that she trusted, that she knew that she could go to, and she could ask for advice. She didn't want to go through pregnancy by herself. She didn't want to go through the shame that society for sure was going to give her at that time. She had to deal with Joseph. <laughs> I can't imagine having to explain to my fiance, even though there's angels helping me out during that explanation, can you imagine explaining to your fiance, I promise you this is really God's doing. I, I didn't just, you know, end up pregnant in normal ways. This is really God's doing. That would be a lot for Joseph to process too. But Mary went, she went with haste and she found comfort in Elizabeth through her family. She was able to go through pregnancy together and not only to go through the pregnancy together with her, but to feel the amazing blessings of those little babies moving. And Elizabeth shared that with her from the very beginning, from the moment that Mary walked into the door. John, who we know as John the Baptist and, Joseph, and Jesus, these little cousins, they shared this amazing spiritual connection. And Elizabeth's little baby John in her womb leapt for joy just at the sound of Mary's voice. It is so amazing to think about everything that took place during this time. As the prophets talked about it, we hear what's coming from one of the least expected prophets. We have one of the least expected people to be the mother of our Savior. And it comes from one of the least expected towns. But it is the greatest, most amazing blessing 
that has ever been given, the most amazing birth. And one of the things that I think is so great about being able to go through the Advent journey every single year and retell these very, very familiar stories is that it's not always us that is waiting for little baby Jesus to be born on Christmas morning. We know how the story goes. We have heard the story since we were itty bitty. We know that that Christ child has been born, that the Christ child teaches us, and that the Christ child has died, and that Christ has risen. But what we sometimes forget is that that Christ child is waiting for us waiting for us to remember who Christ is in our lives. So every year during Advent, we have this time to reflect on our own lives, to think about the ways that maybe we've gotten lost on the path. Maybe we have a chance to think about how we don't feel like we're worth what God has called us to do. Maybe we don't feel like we're capable. Maybe we feel like we need a whole lot of advice from people that we love. We need support along our journey. And every year during Advent, we get to reread these stories and remember that even Mary too went through that. She had those moments of self-doubt, wondering, why me? Am I really good enough for this? And of course, yes, she was. And then Christ comes along and that joyous occasion of a new baby is born. And for each of us in our own Advent journeys, as we get closer and closer to Christmas, we remember that birth. And sometimes it is a rebirth for each of us. This rebirth, this moment in our life where Christ gets to come alive in our hearts again, in our actions, in our spirituality, in everything that we know. And we remember that each of us are also highly favored from God, and that God is calling us to do very amazing things. This Sunday of Advent, I hope that you really reflect on the blessings of home. The blessing of home in your church family, the support and the love and encouragement that you can find, no matter how lost you are feeling, no matter how lonely you are feeling, I hope that you can find the blessing of home in your own families, whether you're spending Christmas alone this year or whether you're going to be surrounded by 30 or 40 people with lots of food. There is love that happens in those homes. And it is an amazing thing. God has called each one of you on this journey. God favors each one of you. God loves each one of you. And no matter how much you doubt yourself, like maybe Mary did at the beginning, Christ is calling you home. Christ is calling you to accept him, to let yourself be reborn as a child of God. Amen. This morning for our hymn of reflection. We aren't actually having a hymn of reflection that we are going to sing, but we are going to have special music brought to us in a very wonderful, wonderful way. One of the, maybe the only great thing that has happened out of COVID. There were other good things, other silver linings, but one of the greatest things that happened out of COVID is that we got really good with technology. And so we are able to be blessed with JP sharing special music with us this morning. And he will be singing One Seed of Love from all the way in North Carolina. This is a song, One Seed of Love by Ricky Skaggs. Crowding down Lost Road, it's not too hard to see. Writing's on the wall if we take time to read. Children are hungry and millions are in need. We need just to take the time to Help a friend who's in danger. One 
see love grow and reach each need. You can grow a mountain of love, just one seed. The seed of love. Oh, why are we here if we're not to help our neighbors? We need to forget ourselves and be more like our Savior. Feel compassion and love for our neighbors. We can grow a mountain of love with just one seed, the seed of love. One day many years ago at a cross at Calvary, that was ever sown was sown for you and me, the seed of love. One seed of love can help a family who's in danger. One seed of love can make a friend out of a stranger. One seed of love can grow and reach all the needs. You can grow a mountain of love with this one seed. Thanks everybody. Merry Christmas.